witches. I don't believe that. I don't believe there are Christian witches. It's like saying small giants. Okay? Or, I don't know. Oxymoron. Oxymoron. Two words that just don't, that contradict each other. Um, that's the lady that runs it. Her name is Valerie Love. Yeah, stay away from Christian witches. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, let's go to uh, Ephesians 6. And we'll start there and we'll have a word of prayer. And uh, appreciate everybody coming. Appreciate it. We had, Michael said we had 220 people. Two, how many? 230? Text it to me. So I, over 200 people in the village that we were streaming to this morning. Over 200 people. So when God told me, when he was whooping me at the altar, when he said, Mike, I'll build this church the way I want to do it. He was, he was right. And uh, I don't have car 213. I don't have cars in the parking lot. But God builds his church the way he wants to do it. And uh, I'm very thankful for that. I, I don't complain much. And um, I'm just very, very thankful for what God has given us and what God has done with us. And we get people like Carmen. Come all the way from Las Vegas. Have you met Tim Barons? Yes. Oh, he's. Oh man. Oh, you got to. He would love that. And uh, yeah, he'll yeah he'll put you to work. He'll give you a handful of tracks. I hear those people over there are going to die and go to hell. So go. Uh, but yeah, I love him to death and appreciate his work in the Lord. Go, uh, uh, Ephesians. What did I tell you? Ephesians six. Ephesians six. Verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That's what I preached this morning. God will have to reduce the size of the army down so that it can be proven that it was him and not any of us. You know, I love it that way. God should get all the glory. He should get all the praise. He's done all the work. He's fought all the battles. He's uh, taken all the hits on himself and he's taken those things away from us and he should get the medals and the crowns and the gold and everything else. He should get all that praise and glory and I would be just glad giving it to him for all of eternity for what he's done and you have people all over the world that hate God and I don't understand that. I, I mean, I guess that's why some people are saved and some people are not. They don't think the same way. And the way some people act, I don't understand that kind of thinking. Uh, Pastor Cooley and I uh, you know, spent some time this week visiting and sharing, as pastors do, the work and the things that they've encountered. Uh, he and I are very, very similar in the, the things we've encountered. And in some cases, we have the same enemies. The same people that hate us, that try to stir stuff up here, same people's doing it in his work there. And I would imagine that they would try it with Brother Kelly's church too. And uh, I got a phone call this last week from one of our stir-ups, guy that likes to stir stuff up here. And uh, he was pretending to be somebody that he was not, and I caught on to it. And he said, yeah, he said, I like you in Reg Kelly. And see, I know some people in Reg Kelly's church. I said, really? I said, who? He didn't name any names. He changed the subject. And there was a certain word that he said that, I, that as soon as he said it, I went, I know who this is. And he hung the phone up very quickly. <laughs> and that's as 
modus operandi. He does it the same way. As soon as you figure out that it's him, he runs. And I'm going, you know what? You little coward. If you really believe what you say you believe, you'd withstand me to the face. Okay? And not this nonsense working behind the scenes stuff. I don't work behind the scenes to try to get this guy in trouble. I don't understand that kind of thinking. But anyway, they're out there and that's what we have to be on guard against. All right. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong with the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of who? God. Remember what David would not wear. Saul's armor. He said, I've not tried it. I've not tested it. I don't know how this works. And you, you got to understand, Saul was, the Bible says, a famous brand of shampoo. What am I saying? Saul was a famous brand of shampoo. He was head and shoulders above everybody else. That's what it says. Or is that shed and shoulders? Head and shoulders. Anyway. And so you imagine, here's little David and here's big Saul. Saul hands him all this armor. says, put this on. And it's like, you know, the sleeves are down below his hands, you know. And the, you know, the, the breastplates hanging down to his kneecaps. You know, he's trying to clunk along with this stuff. And he's going, uh, Saul, I don't need this. So, the, put on the whole armor of God. God is the one who protects us. God is the one who will defend us. Uh, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers. That's where we're at now. And against the rulers of the darkness of this world. That's the sun. Well, not the sun. The moon, the stars. And what they are and what they represent in the Bible. And ruling over people who are in darkness. They have spirits that are ruling over them. And then against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's interesting that the Vatican is set and built on a hill, Vatican Hill. The U.S. Capitol is built, is it in a valley or a hill? It's Capitol Hill, okay? Why do we build these places in high places? Okay, why do we put uh, centralized government in geographic high places? Why do we do that? Um, that's an it that we'll get to that in a little bit. All right. But anyway, we're, we're wrestling against powers, powers that are against us. People that have these powers, try to use these powers, what some of these powers are and what some of these powers are is witchcraft. Deuteronomy 18, that's part of the forbidden practices. God said, do not do these things. And some would say, well, that's the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? It still applies. God hates every form of witchcraft, every form of divination. He hates all of it. Number one, because it's always going to be wrong at least once. It's not going to be accurate. Number two, the forces and the powers that are behind that, the spirits that are whispering the events that are, they say is going to take place in the future, these are evil spirits and they have an agenda behind what they're doing and God hates that religious practice. And, and uh, Galatians, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll get into our study tonight. Heavenly Father, teach us uh, well, teach us, Father, things that are in our lives we can avoid. In our lives, Father, um, we may know somebody work with them, go to school with them. They may be in our family. Somebody that is practicing in or participating in some form of witchcraft or divination or sorcery or uh, regarding those that have familiar spirits or worshiping in the high places or whatever it is. 
We may know people like that. And Father, help us to pray for them and to call out their name before you that the powers that have them in bondage could be broken in their life. It's happened many times before and you're still saving people out of witchcraft. You're still saving people out of cults. You're still saving people out of uh, charismatic madness, uh, false spirits and, and their false doctrines. You're saving people out of that with the truth of your word. And Father, we thank you, God. We are very humbled that you have taken us and planted your word in us and we believe what you say. And Father, that's a unique thing in this world I'm finding out. That there are way more people who hate you and people who despise your word than there are people who love you and love your word. So Father, though we be amongst a few people, we are your people. And we thank you, God, for that. We didn't do that. You did that for us because of your love for us. Help us, dear God, as Paul was and many others in the Bible, be totally sold out, dedicated to you 100%. We pray this in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, in Fe uh, Galatians chapter 5, this is um, the Apostle Paul mentioning witchcraft as being still one of those things that God absolutely hates he forbids it. Uh, he says, if you, in verse, let's go to verse 18. If you be, if you be led by the Spirit, remember the Spirit and the Word are one and the same. If you have this, if you say, I have the Spirit of God, then you must have the Word of God. But if you say, I have the Spirit of God, and the Bible kind of gets in the way sometimes, then you don't have the Spirit of God. You have a different Spirit. A Spirit that is kicking out the Bible rather than bringing it in and embracing it. So if you be led by the Spirit, being led by the Word, by the Bible, you're not under the law. So now the works of the flesh. Here's our body, our flesh. Paul said in Romans 7, it's still under the law. The law has dominion over a man as long as he liveth. So the condemnation of the law exists in my flesh, earthly, flesh and blood, heart beating body. There are days when I can feel in my bones the consequences of what my flesh has done. I can feel it. I know it's there. And so I understand that this body, this flesh, cannot please God. Keep it out of the way as much as possible. And, I mean, I go through what I guess a lot of other people go through. My flesh, my emotions, my feelings telling me something that's contrary to what I know is true from the Word of God. And I hate days like that. It's a battle. It is a struggle. I thank God that I'm still here by His grace. Amen? Not because I'm Superman, but by the grace of God, He sustains me through all that. So it gives me hope in believing that if He sustained me all those times in the past, He's going to yet sustain me in the future. It's the same God. His love for me has not changed. My love for Him grows stronger because of these things that He's done for me. So, led by the Spirit, you're led by the Bible, you don't have to worry about it. Your flesh, here's the works of the flesh that break God's law. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, lasciviousness the first four are in a group together because they are related one to another. Then the next group is idolatry and witchcraft. Okay, number five and number six. Idolatry and witchcraft are related. Remember what Samuel, when he spoke this thing, it's like, now that we know what Samuel said, he got it from God, we understand the connection between the two. Because Samuel, in confronting Saul with what he did or what he didn't do, he said, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as what? Idolatry. 
So the con there's a connection. Rebellion and witchcraft go together. And stubbornness is like or as bad as the sin of idolatry. And God hates statues. God hates them. He said, don't make them. Don't carve them. Don't make them look like me. Don't make them look like anything that's in heaven or anything in the earth or anything, especially in hell. Don't, we don't, who needs a statue of somebody in hell? Amen. But guess what? There are there. Okay. There are statues of people all over the world that died lost and are in hell right now. What good does a statue do for them? Oh, the statue helps us remember them and their great things that they did. But they're screaming in hell. What good? You're not helping them at all. Is that a bucket of water for them? Is that a drop of water? Is that a piece of bread? Is that an air conditioner, a fan? That's nothing. They're getting nothing out of that and God hates it. So the second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. So idolatry, witchcraft linked together. Let me kind of give you a little bit of background into Wicca. Does anybody here want to confess that they at one time looked into witchcraft or Wicca or wizardry or anything like that? Anybody besides me? Okay, two people, three people, four people, okay. I mean, that's our background. That was a draw to certain people. It doesn't work on other people, but it does work on... The devil's got enough sins to cover the whole group, Okay. So, Wicca and witchcraft, the promise that we can use supernatural forces to make things happen for our benefit. Is that a good way of saying it? The promise that we can have the power by way of supernatural forces to gain some sort of benefit. To cast a spell that would bring wealth. To cast a spell that would bring health. To cast some sort of spell or perform a ritual whereby um, somebody could fall in love with you. There are love spells. Here's my favorite. Casting a spell, placing a curse on someone as a form of assassination. It's true. It happens. Okay, I know a man who mysteriously died after having a very heated argument with a well-known charismatic leader who I know has witchcraft in their background. Okay? You can guess details if you want to. I'm not saying names. What I'm saying is, this person that I knew got into a very heated argument and two weeks later died of natural causes. Boom. Just killed over and died. And I do know that there are spiritual assassins. People who, through the power of the devils that manifest themselves in them, they cast a death spell on people, and lo and behold, those people end up dying. Does these, and we're studying devils, the reason why we're studying all this. Do, so do devils have the ability to take life away from human beings? We already know that. We know it from scripture, we know it. So now we, we know it to be a fact. Okay? And I do believe that there are people who have, who are very powerful witches and wiz by the way, witches are not just female, but they're mostly female, but they're not just female, but very powerful sorcerers, very, very powerful witches, very powerful whatever, who if they want somebody dead, 
and that person is not covered and protected by God, they can kill that person by using spiritual, spiritual forces. Okay? A spiritual assassination. That way, you never go to jail for it. How the, how's the prosecutor going to prove that this person died as a direct result of person A casting a death spell on them? No way is that going to end up in a United States courtroom. It's never going to happen. Okay? But anyway, idolatry and witchcraft related together by way of what uh, Samuel said. Rebellion says witchcraft, stubbornness is idolatry. And so that's why I believe in Galatians they're grouped together. But in the, in the background of witches and those who practice Wicca, does anybody know what the word Wicca means? Did you study that one? Where does the word Wicca, W-I-C-C-A, come from? It is a, it's an old English word that is a form of the word wise, W-I-S-E. A Wiccan is someone who has this occult wisdom, this occult um, knowledge. They have, they have, they have unlocked the secrets of casting certain spells. And so they're given the title of Wicca or one who has that kind of wisdom. All right. That, and that's where the word comes from. Wizard is also of the same, uh, derivation, same etymology. My, one of my favorite websites, Etymology Online. You type in the word, it'll tell you where it came from, what the root of it, what language it was. And so you look up wizard and Wicca, and they are both forms of the word wise or wist. Jesus used that word, wist ye not that I must be about my father's business. In other words, do you not have it in your wits that I must be about my father's business? Not Joseph the carpenter. God the God, okay? God the Almighty, okay? That's his father's business. So anyway, that's where the word Wicca and wizard comes from. You see up there on the screen, Wiccans believe that there is an entity, a God, that is their particular God. He is called Cernunos, the horned God, the God who has the um, characteristics of a male, but also the characteristics of a beast. He is both a man and a beast simultaneously. And he has horns coming out of his head. Okay. So, Revelation 13, you can turn there. And here is, here's the real Cernunos. Here's who he really is. This is the God of Wicca. The God of wizardry. The God of witchcraft. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and what? Ten horns. If you look down in verse 13, or verse 18 of chapter 13, here's wisdom. Let him, here's real wisdom, not wicked wisdom. Real wisdom. Let him that hath, had understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. He is the number of a man and the number of a beast. Both of them simultaneous. And notice that this beast, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy, the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, the, and the dragon gave him his what? Power. So we're studying powers. And the dragon has given this beast, Cernunos, his power. 
So the power that he has derives from Satan himself. He gives him that power. And think of the opposite. Jesus said, all power is given unto me. God has the book in his right hand. That's the power. There's power in the book. Amen. There's life in the book. God has the book and he takes it and he gives it to Jesus, the lamb, who's the only one worthy to receive that power. And now Jesus has been given everything that God has. So you see the connection here. God giving his only begotten son, his power through the book. And here is the dragon giving his power over to the beast. It's the exact opposite. If God is light, then all of this is darkness. And it's always going to be the opposite of what God does. Um, he gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So the beast... Or the God behind witchcraft being really the reason why God hates it so much is that the spirit of Antichrist is wherever there is witchcraft being performed. Okay? Um, I ask you to raise your hand a while ago. You don't have to on this, but I'll make it as such. I'll kind of divide the question up. Have you ever performed a a spell or do you personally know or was you with someone who performed a spell of some kind okay anybody ever use a Ouija board or knew somebody that used a Ouija board okay tell me your Ouija board stories I was going to do that anyway your aunt did Mm -hmm. And they were playing with it, and uh, my brother went in there, and he didn't believe in that stuff, so we just stopped playing with them. And when she put it away that night, the whole um, door of the closet, it was like shaking, so she got scared she threw it away. I believe, I believe it. Because everybody in here has got, you're nodding your head going, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, there was a group of kids where we were growing up, Lynn had a Ouija board. Her mom and dad were early members of this church back in the day. They bought their daughter a Ouija board for Christmas. Okay? And they had a party down in the basement of that house. Turn all the lights out. You got a bunch of drunk teenagers pulling out a Ouija board. And stuff is happening. I wasn't there. But I was I heard about it. And similar story. Things were happening that scared the daylights out of them. Okay? These powers are real. These devils are real. And you have things like a Ouija board or a scrying bowl or a gazing ball, crystal ball, or any, any earthly thing that is a point of divination. When you have those things, there is going to be a devil or a string of them that are attached to that point of contact and they're waiting for you to tap in okay notice I said a point of contact who came up with that in Christianity a point of contact Does anybody know Oral Roberts he said the 300 foot Jesus that he saw not making that up when he built his hospital that the city of Tulsa said, we don't need that hospital. God told me to build it. He built it 300 feet tall. Because that was the Jesus that he saw. But anyway, he said God told him that if you touch the television screen while he has his hand up like this, 
that that is a point of contact between you and oral and whatever powers he has can be transferred through the television to you if you just reach out and touch that poltergeist yeah that's 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 wizardry that's sorcery that's not biblical there's nothing nothing in this book about that well they didn't have tv back then ah don't give me that okay because i know they did no i'm just kidding but that that whole idea of a point of contact that's the exact same thing that you have with anything tarot cards Again, gazing balls or crystal balls or scrying bowls, bowls of water or mercury or anything reflective. And the image that you're seeing in there starts out being your image, your reflection, ends up turning into something else. You find yourself face to face with a horned God that you're talking to. You are in contact with a familiar spirit. And these things will always lie but they'll always tell a little bit of truth with it to get you hooked into it. God, I'm just, God hates it. Amen? 2 Thessalonians 2. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth What's the spirit of his mouth? His Bible. I'm t listen, witches hate Bibles. They hate. I had a, a buddy of mine. His mom and dad were missionaries to Brazil. And they encountered a lot of of people who were possessed they would have somebody come in the church and of course you know if somebody comes in your church oh great we got somebody in our church and that then all of a sudden they would just start manifesting sounds talking out loud anything to disrupt the service if this this buddy of mine if his dad suspected that that person might be possessed uh, at some point, I don't know when it was done, but they would, they would get them and they would hand them a Bible. And then try to get them to read certain verses like 1 John 1, 7. 1 John 1, 7 says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Devils don't like blood and they don't like the word of God. And normally, this is what I was told, normally, if they were possessed, they either, they either couldn't read it all, couldn't read it at all, or couldn't see it. Okay? And then they knew they had somebody that was possessed. And again, you know, that's, you know, third-hand information come to me. I've not ever experienced that. Although I did talk with a lady one time who called me scared to death because she was saying that, the Illuminati was erasing verses out of her Bible. And I talked to her a little bit and I finally said, you need to go see somebody local about this one. I can't help you. But anyway, um, the spirit of his mouth is the Bible and witches, wizards, sorcerers, they hate the word of God because it's the power against their powers it's the power that stands up to them it's the power that they can they can cast a spell in your direction but they cannot curse you period you're blessed your curses are all on the cross christ took it away from you so they cannot curse you with an effective curse okay uh, then shall that wicked be revealed whom the lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming in some cases all you need to do is turn the light on and darkness hates light and darkness always leaves when light shows up 
Think of it that way. Because, I mean, you say, well, duh, you turn light on, it's not dark anymore. Yeah, there's a reason why. Darkness hates light, and it must leave when light is present. The light of the Word of God, when it showed up to you, darkness had no choice but to leave. And some point, Carmen, John, some of you others, the light just said, we're staying. We're not going anywhere. Okay? Uh, verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all what? Power. All pa every power that he's got, he's giving it to the Antichrist to use. With all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish because they received not the love of the truth. The truth is the Bible that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So the power that Satan has is going to be given to that wicked when he's revealed. And he's going to have all the power that Satan has right now. Galatians 3. Here's Paul mentioning bewitching someone bewitching or casting a spell of some kind on the churches of the area of Galatia or Gaul. There were we know there were multiple churches there and Paul's writing to them and when he left, because he told this in the book of Acts, he said, I know that after I depart, grievous wolves are going to come in. And they're going to try to take away the real gospel and subvert it with something different. He's going to subvert it with works. And so that's what happened here. Somebody or a group of people cursed the people who go to these churches. Now, some of them, I have to believe some of them just stood firm and they said, we're not, we're not buying it. But it looks to me like a majority of the people fell under the power of that curse. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? So one of the spells that they can cast is a darkness spell. Casting a spell upon someone so that they can't see certain things. You believe that's possible? I do. I absolutely believe it's possible. I think that there are people who are in high positions around the world who can get away with murder because of the occult powers and the people who might investigate them. They just don't see certain things things Bill Clinton that guy's dirty he's as dirty as they come him and his Jezebel Ahab and Jezebel is who they are they are a team right out of the Bible and I believe that very powerful evil powers were working in their favor to cause people to not see what they did okay so in this case, they can't see the real gospel. Somebody's come in and told them, well, yeah, Jesus saves, but he followed the law, so we must follow the law. We must all be circumcised. We must keep the feast days. We must keep the Torah. We must, we, in other words, if we're going to be Jesus followers, we have to be Jews. And if you're a Gentile, then you must conform to Judaism. And that's still going on now. Hebrew Roots Movement, uh, Sabbath Keeping Movement, whatever form it comes in, it is a bewitching spirit that falls on people that makes them believe that the gospel includes works of the law. Because he says it this way, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. 
Uh, one thing I know about Paul is when he preached these churches, he preached Christ crucified. He preached the cross to them and made it plain. So Paul says, this is only what I learned of you. Receive you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Which was it? And the obvious answer is hearing of faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. For by grace are you saved through faith. So the gospel is the hearing of faith. Not the works. Not anybody's works. Not the works of the law. Not the works of a, what a preacher tells you to do. Not the works of, oh, you must speak in tongues or you're not saved. Not those works either. It is nothing but faith believing what God said. That's how you... And I mean, I've had them come to me and say, let me lay hands on you and you impart a, a gift on you. No. Don't touch me. If God wants me to have a gift, He's going to give it to me right out of this book. Because that's where all the gifts are. Receive the Spirit by the hearing of faith. And what you heard, what you heard, Sterling Ken Golf came to your house, didn't he? And he wasn't even pastor of the church that he was preaching revival for, but he came to your house and he gave you the hearing of the Word of God. And Sterling heard it, the light came on, and he believed it. And he got saved there in his living room. Okay, got saved by the hearing of faith without him saying, well, let me start coming to church and get better. Then maybe God will save me. No. Because he'd been waiting a long time. He's not better yet. Okay, he'd been waiting a long time for that. God saved him because he heard and he believes it. So he'll read the Bible. And when he reads it, he just says, you know, I don't understand everything I read, but I believe it. That's what it takes. Okay? People who just believe. You know, Jason Cooley was here. His dad and you are very similar. Very identical. Okay? Quit school at a young age. Went to work. Worked hard all their life, and they just believe the Bible. To them, it's very simple. I just believe what God said, and I say amen to what I hear from the sermons, because I like it, because I know it's true. And he'd be back there saying amen. Even while I was preaching, and I'm Jason, just while I was preaching, he's saying amen. But these guys, they're the, they're the ones that God raised up, that God called, that God gave them the gift of faith. So... What, what, tell me what witchcraft you have to perform. Tell me what words you have to say. Tell me what, you know, there's not, there's not even a prayer in the Bible that we tell people, now you must recite this prayer out loud to God. Whenever I lead somebody to the Lord, it's always, I mean, the base of it is the same, but it's a different prayer almost every time. I don't remember a prayer that I pray every single time with the same people telling them, and I have people calling us all the time saying, Pastor, we love you. We got saved listening to your preaching. And I'm going, how many times have I actually said out loud what they should pray? But what I tell them is, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's, that's manifest that these people are calling unto God and God is saving them. And then God is growing them and making disciples out of them without the right words that they must say without the ritual that must be performed upon them. You see what I'm saying? There's, God is saving them without the, the religious formality that a lot of churches do. What is it? A catechism? If you recite the catechism, that means that you answer all the questions correctly. Where's our former Lutherans at, or former Catholics? Yeah, did you have to? Did you ever have to do a catechism, Jody? Yeah. And what that means is, in the Lutheran Church, once they confirm you, you are an official, written-in member of that church, and because you're a member of that church, you're going to heaven. Yes.
Wow. Like what? You pledge things. What she's saying is they make you pledge things before the Lord. You have to put your hand on your heart or you do like a Boy Scout or. Wow. So you made a pledge that you would abstain from sin. I won't even ask you, Pam, because I love you. I don't want to know if you've ever done anything wrong. Because in my mind, you haven't. You're so sweet and kind. Amen? We don't need Pam to tell us how bad she is. Amen? But you're right. You swear this oath before God that you can't keep, never have. But they say that's your salvation. And I say, no, it ain't. Who hath bewitched them? See, Martin Luther was one step out of the Catholic Church. But to build an entire denomination upon this one man, very short-sighted. Okay? They didn't quite get it right. So anyway, who hath bewitched you? Um, let me t turn to Romans 8, and I'm going to take you where we're going to go next Sunday night. Because I, I, this is the part I like. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual weakness in high places. So what we're going to learn is like, like we learned this morning, as God wanted Gideon and all of the people to understand, your army is too big, I want it down to almost nothing, but I just want 300 guys to hold a lamp and a sword and say these words because I'm the one that's going to save my people. I'm the one that's going to do that. Like in Second Chronicles 20 in Jehoshaphat. They sent, the prophet sent word saying, be not dismayed, nor, uh, be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. God's going to fight it. Let God fight it. Amen? And what we're going to see here is that these principalities and powers, they cannot, God will not allow them to overcome us and take us as their own. Notice this. Romans 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, you are, and I've, this is in the Watchman, it's already uploaded. You are the bride of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. No man from no church has the right to tell you you're not saved. No man has that. No ecclesiastical authority, no tribunal, no council, no church vote. No man. If Christ loves you and wants you to be his girl, hell cannot stop it. Guys, we know what it's like to fall in love with somebody, don't we? And nobody can stop us. Not even her parents. Right? Well, think about it. Here's Jesus, and he's fallen in love with you. And hell itself cannot get in his way. As soon as he sees you. Remember how Isaac, remember what Isaac did? He's out working, and here comes Rachel. You know what brought her in? What brought Rachel to Isaac? Or was it ten camels? Half a pack of camels. <laughs> ten camels. Ten. The law. The law is what brought you to Christ. Amen? The law is what brought you to Christ. And when Isaac saw Rebecca, he didn't say, oh, really? I got to marry that. Uh, no. He ran to her. And he wept. And he took her into his mother's tent. You know who his mother is? Jerusalem. Above is the mother of us all. And heaven is spread out like a tent to dwell in. 
Isn't that cool? Took her into his mother's tent and there was with her. He, soon as he set eyes on her, he loved her and he stopped what he was doing right then and took her to be his wife. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? If Christ sets his love on you, there ain't a man or a devil that can stop Jesus from taking you to be his bride. Amen. Shall tribulation, shall distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Put that in your mind. And start thinking from this day forward. What am I willing to not lose? And so God, when you help me figure that out, then you teach me how I can go ahead and let it go. Because nothing is going to get in Jesus' way of loving you. Nothing is. Nay, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life. Now look at this. Nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers. They cannot separate you. They cannot get in Jesus' way of loving you. Nor things present, nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Who wants to count something? Starting in verse 35, count the number of things that cannot separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I don't, no, 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 no. Count them. Nakedness, peril, or sword. Seven. Seventeen. Seventeen. Seventeen is the number. What's in First Thessalonians four seventeen? Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. What's in Genesis 17? Abram, Abraham, Sarai to Sarah. What's in Matthew 17? Jesus is transformed. His face shining like the sun. 17 is the number for transformation. There are 17 languages spoken at Pentecost. 17 shekels of silver that Jeremiah paid for, to his first cousin for that land and the, and the record was written in those two books that was the evidence that God was going to give them their land back that number 17 always points you to the rapture the translation, the change, the transformation 17 things here that cannot stop Jesus from making you his bride he loves you and not even hell itself can make him stop loving you. Amen? Well, let's stand to our feet. That's good. That's where we're going. We're going to find out that there ain't a power in the world that can stop us. Not a power in the world that can stand in our way, but it's not because of us because of Christ it is Christ loving you and the more he loves you the more he displays it and the more he displays it you know a woman's heart can be changed can it not a woman who sees a guy and says nah you're not it some guys have a way of changing a woman's mind and Jesus definitely changed yours amen. amen he changed yours father thank you for the riches that we have in our hand through this bible 
God, it is worth more than all the gold, all the silver, all the precious gems. It's worth more than all of the riches in the universe put together. It's worth more than that to us. And Father, in this we find that your love for us, no devil and no group of devils, not even hell itself can make you stop loving your people, your bride. So nothing is ever going to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And I thank you for that. Thank you, Lord. If I have breath in this world, I'm going to tell you thank you with it for what you've done for me and what you've done for my family and my church. Father, we want to say that we are forever in your debt, but this is not a debt that we owe. This is a gift that we have received. And we love you for that because you're the husband that gives gifts to your bride. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us the way you do. Dismiss us now in your care. Send us home safely, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. God bless you.